All right, we concluded uh, last time introducing ourselves to Deuteronomy, seeing the important role that uh, this climax of the Torah plays as far as uh, the Old Testament and the rest of Scripture is concerned. Uh, that particularly in the last two generations, uh, so much study has been done on the echoes of Deuteronomy in uh, the uh, latter part of uh, Scripture in the Old Testament and then into the New Testament. We've taken a look at its themes, and I, says, I said as we concluded last time that uh, we come to the purpose and the structure of Deuteronomy, and uh, these are really united in the very first interpretive issue uh, of the, uh, the book of, of Deuteronomy. And so let's just uh, move ahead in our notes. You'll probably have to uh, scan down to where we get to the interpretive problems. But before that, let me just say a word about the bibliography because I'm going to be referring to these, uh, these commentaries uh, as uh, we continue on in our discussion of, uh, of Deuteronomy. As I said, this has been a, a central focus of Old Testament studies and uh, a number of very, very valuable works, beginning with the work by Peter Craigie in the NICOT. So the, the work by Craigie. And it's interesting that Craigie's work on Deuteronomy is one of the few evangelical commentaries on the Old Testament that liberals read and use. Uh, most uh, non-evangelicals, evangelical scholarship is something they do not consult. But Peter Craigie had actually uh, developed a reputation because he was the major translator of uh, the Ugaritic materials and uh, had been involved in, in the translation of the Rosh Shamra documents, the, the Ugaritic, the, the Canaanitic, uh, documents uh, that were found in the 1920s and uh, he had become one of the major students and scholars of those documents uh, dealing with grammars and translations. So, so when he wrote his commentary on Deuteronomy he already had a reputation in uh, the liberal community uh, not based upon his biblical exegesis but because of the fact that he was an expert in Ugaritic literature. And so it was a providential decision by E.J. Young to invite him uh, to be the man who would uh, write the NICOT commentary on Deuteronomy. And this was one of the early volumes after Young's own works on, uh, on Isaiah. And, uh, and he stunned the liberal community by taking a essentially early date for the book and essential mosaic authorship based upon the studies that were being done in, uh, in ancient Near Eastern uh, covenants and law codes and uh, particularly the uh, Hittite treaties that we're going to be speaking about in just a few minutes. And so he, he, he gave an evangelical perspective on this study, which had, had actually emerged out of, uh, of uh, liberal circles itself and, and really used it uh, against the liberals, uh, as I said, to assert a basically mosaic core and uh, early uh, date for the, for the book of Deuteronomy. Now, he was a late date as far as the Exodus and Conquest was concerned. And uh, so, of course, uh, put it just a little later than we would, but nevertheless, uh, it was a, a book which, it, which it, one of the game changers, if you can put it that way, as far as Old Testament studies, it came out in 1976. So at, uh, at, at this point, it's been almost 40 years since it was published. And uh, even though obviously scholarship has, has uh, gone beyond Craigie at this point, so I wouldn't say he's a must buy, uh, certainly, it is the most important commentary on Deuteronomy that, has, that was published in the, uh, the 20th century. And uh, because of that, a lot like Wenham on Leviticus, uh, the same thing with uh, Craigie on Deuteronomy, you should have it because everybody, both liberal and conservative since then, has to interact with, uh, with Craigie's work. 
And one of those who did was Eugene Merrill, the uh, Dallas Seminary prof, who's also the uh, author you're reading with Kingdom of Priests. But he, uh, he has given us an outstanding commentary in the NAC series on Deuteronomy, and that is what I would star as the first buy. That, uh, uh, that is the first uh, reference tool that you should use as uh, you study uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, since then, uh, uh, Gordon McConville has uh, brought out his Apollos Old Testament commentary on Deuteronomy, which is very, very valuable. And uh, Wright's, Christopher Wright's work in the NIB COT is a good work. Wright is uh, ha and has become a major writer in Old Testament ethics and Old Testament missions. And uh, so this is one of the most vital volumes in, uh, in that series. And uh, just a couple of years ago, Dan Block's uh, NIVAC commentary came out on Deuteronomy. And uh, Block is another outstanding evangelical Old Testament uh, exegete. And uh, too bad that he trimmed it down to 800 pages. He sent about 12 to 1300 pages to the publisher. Uh, that has been abridged. And, uh, and that's uh, Dan Block for you. But a very va valuable, very vital work, uh, and along with the work by Raymond Brown, British expositor on the message of Deuteronomy. And so these, these works will give you a, a good summarization, a good introduction to the contemporary evangelical discussion on this book. And right away, you're going to deal with what is the purpose, what is the structure of the book. And uh, this all ties in with this discussion on Deuteronomy's relationship to ancient Near Eastern documents, ancient Near Eastern law codes, and uh, particularly the treaties that uh, were made nation to nation, nation to those that they uh, conquered, and, uh, and the fact that there was uh, some very definite uh, structure to these law codes and to these treaties that uh, was seen not only in the second millennium BC, but then uh, a more simplified pattern that was followed in the first century BC as well. And the lively debate upon whether Deuteronomy fits better in the second millennium BC context, as argued by Craigie, or in the first century context, as, uh, as now averred by some of those who would uh, say that Craigie had, uh, had gone too far. Well, let's orient ourselves to this discussion, and I've given you this chart to help you think through what uh, this discussion entails. Uh, we need to realize that long before the Torah, long before Moses, actually stretching back now into the third millennium BC, we have ancient law codes that were given by kings to their subjects. That, uh, these law codes uh, are a recounting of the basic ordinances, the basic statutes that a king gave for the order of his kingdom. And uh, the most famous of these, and the most influential of uh, these, was the famous Code of Hammurabi, which was propounded, as you can see, right around 1750 BC, or a good 300 years before the Torah, that we already have a law code. We already have a king giving his basic legal stipulations you know, to those whom he ruled. And as you read the, uh, the Code of Hammurabi, before you get to the laws themselves, you have, as you can see, a historical prologue, a, an epilogue, where Hammurabi speaks about the fact of how the, the gods, and particularly Marduk, the god of Babylon, had, had given to Hammurabi his position as king, and he was acting on the basis of this uh, divine impulse to rule over the people and, 
and basically that the laws that he were, was giving were not just his, but also came from this divine mediation. And uh, so there is a historical prologue, and then at the very end there's a historical epilogue that uh, reasserts and reestablishes what is said. Then after this uh, introduction, this prologue, you then have the lengthy listing of the laws themselves. And then before the epilogue, Hammurabi gives the blessings and the curses that would come upon his people, blessings if they obeyed, and curses if they disobeyed. And some of those blessings, as far as health and prosperity and long life, were, uh, uh, were spelled out in the blessings, and then obviously the exact opposite was spelled out as far as curses. If you obey, this is, this is what will result. If you disobey, this is what will result. And then an epilogue reminding the, uh, the people that, uh, that Hammurabi, again, had been given his position and these laws and the ultimate blessings and curses would come from the gods. Right now, you read the Code of Hammurabi and you start to realize there are some similarities in the nature and the structure of that law code with what is given in the Torah as, as Moses is the divine law keeper who is speaking on behalf of Yahweh to Israel. That just like Hammurabi, only what Moses is communicating in the Torah as, as you have read and we have seen is the fact that these laws do not begin with him. The laws come from Yahweh, thus says the Lord, this is what you are to command the sons of Israel. We saw that again and again in Leviticus. And, and there's a sense as you read through the, the latter part of Exodus and into Leviticus and the first part of Numbers, the Sinaitic portion, as it were, of uh, this text, uh, that there are similarities in the way Moses speaks to Israel and the way that Hammurabi uh, spoke to the, uh, to the Babylonians. Now, of course, there's also some major differences as well, uh, particularly in the content of what was said. And uh, certainly uh, uh, Moses is uh, speaking of the true God, Israel's God, God whom they have seen, you know, act and work in their history, and they had uh, experience at Sinai, that uh, there is uh, certainly much more historical narrative that frames the, uh, the law code in the, the Torah than in the code of Hammurabi. Now, if our dating is right, uh, approximately 350 years after the code of Hammurabi, we have the Torah and the Torah that culminates in Deuteronomy. Uh, right around 1405, 1406 B.C. So approximately 350 years later. At the very time when uh, the Hittites were expanding their dominance and their control in the ancient Near East, it became a dominant player between 1400 to 1150 B.C. And uh, the, the Hittites, as they came storming out of, uh, of Asia Minor, contemporary Turkey, and started to come into the northern part of the Levant, uh, you know, the uh, contemporary Syria and the northern part of Iran. So notice that the hot spots of the world have not changed a whole lot in the, in the centuries that have passed. But as they came and uh, they conquered these peoples, what they would do is, is they would give them now what is known as a treaty, which again is an expanded law code. Now, now these were foreign rulers who were giving these treaties, and of course the conquered peoples had to accept, you're conquered. Uh, so this is not a, a treaty between equals this is a treaty given by the conqueror, by the Susan, by the king, by the sovereign one over the conquered peoples. 
And so they had to, uh, they had to hear and they had to respond. And uh, significantly, these treaties, as we take a look at the numbers of them that have been found, again, have a basic a structure and basic content that begins with a preamble that uh, speaks in terms of the Hittites and their gods and the peoples and their gods and, uh, and uh, then moves into a historical prologue, the preamble basically giving the parties to the covenant and uh, their gods and then into a short or lengthier historical prologue on the dealings that have taken place between the Susan and his vassals. And by the way, this was to make the Susan look good. He talks about all the positives that he has done and all of the positives he has brought into the life. And, and once again, the times the gods would be invoked on how they've allowed him to have this kind of interaction with these peoples and how it has brought a benefit to them. And so basically, the historical prologue is just that. It's a history of the dealings of the king with, with now these conquered peoples, these vassals. And, uh, and again, speaking in a positive tone. Then you have a lengthy section of stipulations. So lengthy that the stipulations are broken down into, at the very beginning, some basic stipulations. Here are the essential commandments, the essential ordinances that are being given by the king to his vassals. And then having given these basic commandments, then uh, there will be more detailed commandments that fill in and, uh, and specify you know, how these broader commandments will relate in the, the day by day in a relationship uh, between these conquered peoples and their king. Now, having given the stipulations, then there would be a process by which the treaty would be stored and periodic readings of that treaty would be called for. Obviously, at the very beginning, there was, uh, there was a treaty was to be read and uh, then a copy was to be held by the king. A copy was also to be available to the people. And uh, the people were to hear that same treaty, that same document read at, uh, and on specific occasions that uh, were delineated within the treaty itself. After that, there was the blessings and the curses. Well, we talked about with Hammurabi. That uh, if you obey, here are the blessings that will come upon you. If you don't obey, here are the curses that will come upon you. With an invocation to the gods. Here are the gods. The gods are to be the ones who will witness. They are the ones who will witness the faithfulness of the king and the faithfulness of the people and monitor this and bring the appropriate blessings. They're also the gods, and again, usually the gods basically of the Hittites and then the conquered peoples. They would witness to the, the disobedience on the part of the people and therefore the, the flowing out of the curses. And, and so the gods were the witnesses. And, and there is a call at the end of the treaty that the gods would witness to, uh, to the... Uh, to this treaty and uh, to the obedience that has been pledged by the vassals to the suzerain and what that, uh, oh, what that pledge looks like as far as obedience is concerned and how if the people were disobedient, there's no assumption the king will ever be unfaithful to the covenant, but if the people are unfaithful to the treaty, to the covenant, then how the gods could be invoked and on that basis the king could bring the, uh, the curses that uh, were part of the, the covenant. Now, when you think in terms of the Sittai treaties, uh, when you think in terms of a preamble, which gives the basic parties to the covenants, and you come to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 1.3 came about in the 40th year 
on the first day of the 11th month that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all the Lord had commanded him to give to them. And here is the preamble stating very definitely that uh, these are the words of Yahweh through Moses. These are the words Yahweh had commanded him to give to them. And of course, this is the parties. It's Yahweh. It's Israel. The mediator is Moses. And of course, you don't have to speak about, about the, uh, you know, the gods of Israel because Yahweh is the God of Moses. He's the God of Israel. All right? But again, here's a party. Yahweh commanding through Moses. Preamble. And then beginning in uh, verse 5 through the end of chapter 3, you have a lengthy historical prologue where Yahweh speaks uh, through Moses. And in fact, it's Moses, uh, one five, who undertook to expound this law, saying, verse 6, the Lord our God spoke to us at Horeb, saying, and beginning with uh, what transpired there at the end of their time at Sinai, how then God directed them and has led them through the wilderness and uh, has, uh, has, has, uh, uh, has directed them in their dealings, uh, chapter 2, with uh, the, uh, the peoples they've come in contact with, uh, from, the, uh, from the Edomites, to the Moabites, to the Ammonites, to then the Canaanites, and how he has given them in chapter 3 victory over the Canaanites and, and the land that uh, they at that point uh, possessed. And uh, by the way, there's a very definite emphasis in chapters 1 to 3, this historical prologue of Deuteronomy, of Yahweh's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness. Yet, in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness, the judgment upon the first generation, God has remained faithful to the covenants. Now, I start chapter 4, verses 1 to 43, particularly verses 1 to 40, which is, which is a exhortation to Israel, remembering Horeb and what took place at Sinai in the giving of the covenant that Israel should be obedient. They learn a lesson. Chapter 4 is Moses saying, you know, at, at Sinai, a theology lesson was given. Yahweh was revealed to you. Now take to heart what you learned and be responsive. And, uh, and uh, he, he comes to the, uh, to the conclusion of how uh, Yahweh spoke, uh, verse uh, 33. Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire as you heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation from within another nation? What has taken place? What you saw the Lord your God do for you in Egypt before your eyes. Verse 35, to you it was shown that you might know that the Lord, He is God. There is no other besides Him. Therefore, verse 39, Know today and take it to your heart that He is Lord, He is Yahweh, He is God in heaven above, and on earth beneath there is no other. That's the culmination of the theology lesson you learned. The uniqueness of Yahweh. And uh, the fact that there is no other God like Yahweh. So take it to heart. So you, verse 40, shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long on the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. All right? So remember what you learned about Yahweh. Take it to heart live on the fact that Yahweh is the one and only, the supreme God. He is your God. He has chosen you. He has brought you to himself. And now the exhortation, keep his statutes and his commandments with the result that you might 
reap his blessing as you go into the land. Now, the reason I start that is, is because that's not, no exhortation is ever given to Hittite Lorcos. I mean, this is, this is unique. This is distinct. This is different. Then we get into the stipulations, and very interestingly, it begins in chapter 5 with a restatement of the 10 words. And after that restatement, 522 to 1122 is then, once again, an extended exhortation on Israel to take these commandments to heart. So beginning in 522, these words the Lord spoke to your assembly. From the midst, at, at, at the mountain, from the midst of the fire, of cloud, of thick gloom, with a great voice. And he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And uh, the Lord heard your voice. <laughs> Uh, Yahweh, don't speak to us directly. Moses, would you, get, would you get what Moses wants to say? Whatever you say, we'll do. Verse 28, the Lord heard the voice, and the Lord said to me, I've heard the voice of the words of the people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all they have spoken. And by the way, then adds, and this, this now becomes a note that is going to trail through the rest of Deuteronomy. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. This is in response. They've done well. They have done well to say all that Yahweh has said we will do. But Yahweh goes on to say all that they had a heart that internally they were moved to fear and keep the commandments that it may go well with them. So now like a shadow as you hear the stipulations throughout Deuteronomy, you're getting ready for the culmination of Deuteronomy, which is I've given you these commandments, I'm exhorting you to follow them that it might be good, you might reap God's blessing, but you won't. Because your heart has not yet been changed. We go say to them, return to their tents. As for you, stay here and speak. But, uh, but once again, chapter 6, verse 3, O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do. That is the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God is commanding me to teach you that it may be well with you, that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and this is what we see. Moses reminding the people of God, God's goodness, how God has acted in the past. Again, giving them a reminder of the theology they should have learned about who God is. And on that basis, the fact that their hearts might be changed, that they might hearken to and respond to what God has commanded, that it may go well for them. And then after that, uh, you know, lengthy exhortation, 522 to 1122, uh, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1, these are the statutes and judgments which you shall carefully observe in the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth or live on the, the ground, the land that God has given to you. That these are the commandments, these are the statutes, the judgments which you are to follow. And then we have this lengthy listening, listing of these detailed commandments. And yet once again, concluding in chapter 26 with uh, once again, words of, uh, of exhortation. The Lord, uh, this day, the Lord commands you to do these statutes and ordinances. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have today declared that the Lord to be your God and that you would walk in his ways, keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and listen to his voice. And the Lord has today declared to you to be his people, a treasured possession as he promised you and that he would keep all of his, and, and that you would keep all his commandments 
and that he shall set you on high above all the nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall be a consecrated, you shall be a set-apart people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Let me remind you of what you committed yourself to, that you might follow, you might obey, and that my God might bring the promises that he has made and uh, bring this to reality in your experience. Which gives the background, backdrop then to chapters 27 and 28 where, uh, where he enters into the blessings and the curses. With an immediate reading of these, of these well, curses when they get into, into the land in chapter 27 verse 15, and then in 28, 1 through 68, the blessings and then the curses. And by the way, do you notice that the curse section is five times longer than the blessing section in chapter 28? 14 verses, you know, Moses spells out the blessing. These are the blessings that will come with obedience. And then beginning in verse 15, so you have uh, 54 verses that are dedicated to the, to the curses. Almost five times as much on the curses. And it's interesting, in chapter 27, when they, when they get over the Jordan, which you're going to see fulfilled in Joshua chapter 8, and they go to uh, Mount Ebel and Gerizim, they will recite the curses. By the way, it's interesting, they're all curses, there's no blessing. And it's almost a sense which you read chapter 27 and 28 and say, Moses, you, you, you really emphasize the curses much more than the blessings. And of course, that prepares you for chapter 31, chapter 32, well, and even chapter 29. The, the curses is what's going to come upon you. The, you're going to go on the land, you're going to disobey, you're going to experience the curses and the blessings, chapter 33, are only for the distant future. And of course, also in uh, chapter 32, how, uh, chapter 31, I'm sorry, how Moses uh, calls, uh, it is the beginning of chapter 32, he calls heaven and earth. Uh, and uh, there's almost a sense in this uh, song, give here, O heavens, let me speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Heaven and earth. And of course, this is almost like appealing to the witnesses that have heard what Yahweh has said to Israel, what Israel has said back to Yahweh, and now as the, uh, the curses, as the judgments are going to come upon Israel, the witnesses are called. Now with the non-starred elements, you can, you can see how a great deal of what is in Deuteronomy fits very closely into both the structure and content of these Hittite treaties. Now, even though the treaties we have found basically post-date Moses, uh, uh, the interaction between Egypt and the Hittites uh, very possibly could have uh, taken place in uh, the century beforehand when uh, Moses was in Egypt and it was brought up in all of the wisdom and all of the knowledge of the Egyptians. And of course, if you're a late datist like Craigie, there is no problem. I mean, Moses was learning this right in the heart of when the Hittites were proposing these treaties to the, to the vassals that they had conquered. And though they never conquered Egypt and basically uh, in the Levant, uh, north of uh, contemporary Israel, uh, that uh, the Egyptian power and the Hittite power basically uh, came and neutralized one another. That uh, certainly if, uh, if Moses had been a part of, of, the, of the house of Pharaoh during the 1300s, during the 14th century BC, he, he would have been well aware of the Hittites and possibly aware of these treaties. And of course, you can see how then Craigie makes the, makes the jump that knowing this, this is the pattern that he has followed as far as Deuteronomy is concerned. 
Now to say that this is, like Craigie did, a covenant renewal, a renewal of the Sinaitic covenant based upon the structure of these Hittite treaties, is going beyond the evidence. Uh, as we have seen, yes, even though there are echoes of what later was seen in Hittite treaties and even echoes of what was seen previously in these law codes of the ancient Near East of uh, Mesopotamia, certainly as we take a look at, uh, at Deuteronomy, yes, there are echoes, but there are some, some significant differences both between the law code and the treaties. And that's what I've started. The chapter 4, and chapter 5, 22 to 11:32, and 26, 16 to 19. Again, again re reflecting back to history and a and historical narrative reminding, uh, you know, Israel of their obligation. Uh, chapter 29, the other covenant. Uh, chapter 32, verse 48, the narrative that, uh, uh, that is around the blessing of Moses that is given in chapter 33. These are elements that are not found in ancient law codes, that are not found in these ancient Hittite treaties. And so to say that Deuteronomy mirrors specifically these ancient law codes or mirrors specifically these Hittite treaties is to go beyond the, uh, the evidence. The second thing about the Hittite treaties, they, they were never renewals. The treaty was given, and then that treaty was periodically read. It was the same treaty. So once again, to say that this is the same treaty renewed with the second generation. Uh, yes, there are significant uh, similarities but it's interesting, particularly as you go through the laws, and a good example of that is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20. This obviously is included among the statutes and the judgments that uh, Moses gave to second generation Israel. And uh, chapter 20 is all about going to battle and the laws that are to be followed as uh, they would engage a city and uh, whether they could uh, uh, give peace or not, what they are to do with captives, etc. And everything in Deuteronomy chapter 20 is new. Nothing like that was ever given according to what's in Torah at Sinai. Uh, so this is not, as you go through Deuteronomy, just a mere rehash of what took place at Sinai. It is now Moses not only exhorting Israel, but giving further commandments that related to the second generation as they would go in to conduct military operations and the result of those operations and the result then of having the land and what to do with the land as far as dividing the land and uh, living upon the land, things that had not been given while Israel was at Sinai. Uh, so the, the very nature of Deuteronomy does not fit into what we know about these ancient law codes and treaties. And uh, to say, as uh, the, the purpose uh, statement that, uh, that is uh, given, in the, uh, that uh, flows out of this, and maybe I should get this on the screen so you can see it, you can uh, just go down. That Craigie's position, uh, which became very, very popular in the 80s, was that uh, Deuteronomy was nothing other than a covenant renewal document. This was Yahweh's renewal of the Sinaitic covenant with the second generation on the plains of Moab. It's a renewal of the Sinaitic uh, document using these law codes and treaties as, uh, as the framework in which this covenant renewal took place. 
Now it is, it is Merrill that in his commentary points out that uh, even though he thinks that uh, there is a framework of the covenant renewal that is seen in Deuteronomy, and you can also read uh, that in the word and the uh, world and the word, which Deuteronomy was penned by Merrill. So you're getting a summary of Merrill's position as uh, you read uh, that text. But uh, he would say, well, all right, it's, it's a basic framework of covenant renewal with these exhortations added. And, uh, and uh, Merrill's uh, position has, uh, has uh, certainly much more to commend it than just a straight covenant renewal document of Craig and those that have followed him. Now the issue comes on whether this is a covenant renewal document, even though it has similarities. As we've seen, it has major differences. And it is significant, and I drop down to D, that before this extra biblical testimony was found in the 20th century, the Hittite treaties, that, uh, and if we go back to Kyle and Dalich, that uh, through both the history of Jewish interpretation and Christian interpretation to the 20th century, Deuteronomy was read and understood as a record of the speeches of Moses that explain and call for obedience to the Mosaic Covenant, though I would add to that in my purpose statement of when we get there, as you'll see, uh, that, yes, exhorted to obey, but already the prophecy of, of non-compliance, disobedience, that is ar already seen within the biblical text. McConville, in the past uh, decade, has enunciated another understanding where Deuteronomy is not just speeches, but basically the speeches give a narrative a narrative that established a pattern in Israel's past, in Israel's present, and Israel's future of God's grace after failure that reaches all the way to the end of the days. So McConnell will say, you take a look at chapters 1 to 3, this historical prologue, what does it remind you of? Israel pledged obedience but failed. God in grace did not destroy them, continued to, to exhibit covenant loyalty, and therefore will bring them into the land under Joshua. Moses gives the stipulations in the present, but he says to the present generation, you're going to go on the land, and are you going to obey or disobey? You're going to disobey. You're going to fail, but God's going to extend grace. And even though ultimately the, the covenant Curses are going to come upon you. Even that, as God does that in the future, is going to be a, a prelude to his ultimate grace that is going to bring you to repentance and restoration and, uh, and life in the land. So he said, really, Deuteronomy, and this ties in with how then it becomes, as it were, the prototype it becomes the, the basic pattern that the rest of Scripture is going to follow, Old and New Testament, which is what? Israel's failure, God's grace, God's restoration. And he would see that as, as being Israel's history culminating in the post-exilic generation. But that post-exilic generation also failing, and failing most significantly when? What was the great sin of the post-exilic generation? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ, their failure, again, uh, leads to God's grace. That brings salvation, and he was seeing the eschaton, which is now the, the, uh, the end of the days, which is the church age, because he's not millennialist. That, that this is the whole pattern. You understand Deuteronomy, you understand the whole pattern of the Bible. Because what Deuteronomy does is look to... Uh, particularly Genesis, and again, you can see this pattern for the whole nations in Genesis 1 to 11, but he particularly gives it Genesis 12 to the end of the book of Numbers. It looks back and says, there's the pattern of the first generation. Israel's failure, God's grace. 
The second generation is going to go on the land and fail. That's present. And then in the future, there'll be a future failing of Israel. And, and the cycle is going to go again and again until ultimately God brings the culmination, uh, well, for him, in the eternal state. Now, having said that, I wouldn't say that is the overarching purpose of Deuteronomy. But the convo is isolate a very important theme of Deuteronomy, which is Israel's failure that ultimately is met with God's grace and that the ultimate restoration is going to take place in the eschaton. And I would not see the eschaton as being the church. I would see the eschaton as what God is going to do to restore Israel as a redeemed, set-apart nation, changed heart in relation to him in the, uh, the future. All right, so these are uh, the... The, the four basic approaches as far as both the purpose and structure. And you notice how purpose and structure are very closely linked together. That A and B are going to closely follow the, the outline, and you see this in the world and the word, of, of this uh, treaty structure. As opposed to position D, which is going to structure this uh, portion, this culminating portion of the Torah around the Mosaic speeches. Well, now we can go back with that lengthy discussion on where I would land and why. And I think you already know it. Uh, I, I, I see too many loopholes. Uh, too many distinctions to say that as we're reading Deuteronomy, we are reading a covenant renewal document, even a covenant renewal framework in which some exhortations are given. Again, before the 20th century, good and godly minds read Deuteronomy and heard the speeches of Moses. And saw that, yes, that even though these speeches of Moses gave further instruction, expounded, taught, that uh, what is unique about Deuteronomy is that based upon this instruction, Moses then exhorted, pleaded with Israel to be faithful to Yahweh and to the Sinaitic Covenant. So they were already read, so that they might go in and possess the land. Though it becomes very clear from chapter 5, when it is first introduced and then becomes very explicit in uh, Deuteronomy 29, 30, 31, 32, that uh, though Israel was going to go into the land unto Joshua, he foretold that Israel would fail to obey Yahweh in the land. And so a very important component of the conclusion of Deuteronomy is how God was going to handle that disobedience and bring the curses of the covenant that would ultimately bring Israel to repentance. And on the basis of their repentance, after the judgment had been complete, how God would finally bring his blessings to Israel in and at the end of the days. So that uh, the literary structure works out this way, and I take now the speeches of Moses when it says, and Moses said, and Moses said, and Moses said. And as you go through, very definitely, there are five distinct speeches of Moses. The one that's introduced in 1.5. Moses undertook to expound this law saying in uh, chapter 5, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, as I already said, and then beginning in chapter 12, these are the statutes and judgments. It's all part of the speech. And uh, Moses uh, continues to speak even through the curses and the blessings. And then you get to chapter 29, verse 2, Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, 
We have at the end of chapter 31, verse 30, Moses spoke in the hearing of the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were complete. And then chapter 33, verse 1, this is the blessing which Moses, the man of God, blessed the sons of Israel before his death. Right, these are the culmination of narratives that, that lead to Moses giving a speech. And we have five distinct speeches. By the way, we're very creative with the first three speeches. They're known as speech one, speech two, speech three. And then speech four is the song of Moses, and speech five is the blessing of Moses. Now, what is not in dispute except for chapter 29, verse 1, is the fact that each one of these speeches, before we get, you know, Moses... Uh, you know, speaking to all Israel, assembling all Israel and saying uh, that we have a, a narrative portion. Then we have the speech. And in chapter 4, verses uh, 41 to 43, the setting apart of the uh, cities of refuge on the, uh, on the east, as a prelude to what's going to take place in the west after the conquest. Again, indicative and a reminder of how God had been faithful to start the conquest of the Canaanites. That obviously is uh, within the speech. And so this narrative conclusion. And certainly after the song in chapter 32, verses 44 to 47, and again after the song in chapter 33, in chapter 34, we have not only a narrative introduction, but a narrative conclusion. That leads to, and this is structurally the, uh, the most uh, debated uh, question. What do we do with chapter 29, verse 1? Now here's a place where the Masoretic tradition does not follow my chart. The Masoretic tradition says what we have in English in 29.1 should be read as the conclusion to chapter 28. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab, besides, in addition to the covenant which he had made with them at Horeb. That they view this as a narrative conclusion. Two problems with this. And as one who says, unless there are good reasons, you should follow the Masoretic tradition, not only as far as the text itself, but how it says the text is to be read. Unless there is good reason to call into question the Masoretic decision, and I think there is good reason to call that to question at this point. Two reasons. Number one, these are the words. The only other time it is used in Deuteronomy in chapter 1 is in a narrative introduction, not in a conclusion. Two, if there is no narrative introduction, then speech number three becomes a speech without a setting. It would be unique. Now you can say, well, it's already going to be unique. Well, no, not if it's an introduction. Because for some reason, Moses allows speech two and speech three to have no narrative conclusion. For some reason, they are open-ended. In fact, you end speech Two, with Moses again giving the instruction and exhortation for Israel to be obedient, and obedience, disobedience leading to blessings and curses, and you end chapter 28 saying, and so what? Is Israel going to be blessed or cursed? Well, hang on, that's going to be dealt with in the speech and in the further narrative that's going to come in Deuteronomy. So it's open-ended at this point. 
And the same thing with chapter 29 and 30. If, if God has laid before Israel another covenant, what was their response? And you end the book of Deuteronomy, and there has been no response. Basically, this open-endedness says, just like this, to be continued later. But this continuing later is not seen within the Torah and how then the Torah, that is Deuteronomy, culminates and how it's going to be spelled out in the form of prophets when we get there. But this is open-ended and will not come back to the fore until we get to the latter prophets. So Moses answers the question in Deuteronomy here, not specifically here, but later. That then becomes, and we can almost, uh, we can almost put in, not only to, you know, to be finalized in Deuteronomy, but particularly to be seen in the former prophets. All right. What was Israel's response to this speech? Former prophets. What was Israel's response to this speech? All right. Well, we'll find that out when we get to the latter prophets. And so there is a sense in which to be continued. And uh, yeah, I, I would just state that I think uh, it, is, it is a better decision. I mean, I can't be ultimately dogmatic. There are good and godly men like Merrill who will argue very strongly for 29.1 being the concluding narrative and then a speech by itself. But I would go along with the majority of the commentators that would say it makes better sense to see chapter 29, verse 1, as being an introductory narrative to the speech that is given in 29, 2 through 30, 20. But realize that's not the way the Masoretes understood it. Now, what flows out of this understanding of Deuteronomy and uh, now I'll give some titles to the first, second, and third speech. The first speech is a historical perspective, narrative introduction, the speech itself. Here is the exhortation, chapter 4, verses 1 to 40, and the narrative conclusion. So now the exhortation is obviously part of the speech. The speech is divided into two parts, historical review and exhortation to obey. We get to the second speech. Right again, we're going to have an introduction. And uh, the speech continues with the blessings and the curses. But now we have the exhortation after the narrative, after the giving of the ten words with a further ex exhortation to obey the law, a lengthy exhortation before the specific stipulations that uh, with their conclusion in chapter 26 leads into the statements concerning the blessings and the curses in 27 and 28. So by and large, A, B, and C, because there is no concluding narrative. The third speech is simply the making of another covenant. That's how the narrative in 29.1 describes itself. What is that other covenant? That's another interpretive issue. Then we have the fourth song, which everyone calls the Song of Moses. Again, the, uh, the narrative that uh, speaks about the replacement of Moses by a new leader and written scripture. That uh, Moses' leadership of the people is going to be taken over by Joshua. But his spiritual instruction of the people is going to remain through his words. So Moses dies and he is replaced by a new leader. But Moses dies and his instruction is replaced not by verbal instruction, but by written instruction. Now the Torah itself takes the place of Moses as teacher. And, uh, and then we have the communication of the song of Moses to Israel, that narrative that concludes it. And then Yahweh's directives concerning Moses' death. Go up and take a look at the land. 
the end of chapter 32, which is a prelude to the blessings which Moses gave to Israel before he died. And having given those blessings, we then have the narrative of his death. And that is, I would say, an outline form how what I've charted for you flows as far as Deuteronomy is concerned. All right, questions or comments? Is there any record of Egyptian treaties, or is it just uh, the Hittite that, that we're using? Are there evidence? No, okay, when it comes to treaties with conquered peoples, no. And that doesn't mean they didn't, didn't exist. We just have not, you know, found records uh, of them. Obviously, did they have law codes too? And the answer is yes. But they were not stylized with the same kind of structure that we have with Mesopotamian law codes, of which, as I said, the preeminent and best example is the law code of Hammurabi. There's only one of, you know, uh, five or six law codes we've actually found from the third and second millennium BC in Mesopotamia. So it, it's usually viewed that it is, uh, you know, Moses, and, and again, because of, of Egypt's involvement, you know, in the ancient Near East, that we now know that uh, through the third and second millennium BC, I mean, Egypt had contact with these other nations, and, uh, and actually people flow took place. Um, uh, not to the extent, obviously, of a cosmopolitan like structure that we have during the Roman Empire or like today, but, uh, but it wasn't uh, monolithic either. The Egyptians came into contact with the Mesopotamians and vice versa. Um, and, uh, and Mesopotamians came to Egypt and Egyptians went to Mesopotamia. Uh, so, uh, so there was uh, much more of an interchange and inner flow uh, than is usually uh, um, you know, recorded within the, uh, the textbooks. So, we might say that uh, it doesn't seem as Egypt was as influenced by this, but they knew about it. And of course, that then would tie into Moses, that uh, Moses would know of these Hittite treaties. He would know of these Mesopotamian law codes uh, because of his uh, knowledge, you know, being brought up in the, uh, the court of Pharaoh. Uh, and, uh, and different from the Egyptians, these influenced him more than they had influenced the Egyptians. But, uh, but they would have, yeah, the same. I mean, any king has got to, as number one, got to say, you know, the gods are behind me. You need to listen to me. And, uh, and so, you know, invoking the authority of the gods, you know, for his power. And then on the basis of the authority given to him by the gods as the leader, you know, to, um, uh, to give, you know, basic laws that are to govern what's to take place you know, under his, uh, his rule. Uh, so that is, to a certain extent, any culture will have that. Now, uh, the Egyptians did not follow the same kind of structure in uh, putting that forth as did the Mesopotamians and then uh, with other conquered peoples like the, uh, like the Hittites, to our knowledge at this point. I always got to remember with archaeology, that we're always dealing with a very limited amount of information. Uh, compared to what was out there. Um, you gotta remember 200 years ago, um, up, up to almost 100 years ago, so for almost a century, biblical skeptics didn't believe the Hittites even existed. And now we hear our discussing about, you know, Hittite influence upon the possible structure of an Old Testament book. So how things change very, very radically based upon, you know, findings that we have to realize. And our own Dr. Grassani, actually, in the latest edition of Jets, has uh, written about some of the latest archaeological finds and, and uh, what relationship they might have, you know, to, uh, to, to, to biblical history. So I'm going to see that in the latest uh, 2013 uh, fall edition. So September 2013 Jets, he talks about some of the you know, some of the uh, discoveries that have been made in the last 10 years and how they might impact and affect our understanding of certain historical uh, narratives in the Old Testament. So, uh, so this whole aspect of archaeology and, uh, you know, insights it may or may not give us to the Old Testament is a continuing phenomenon. But this is a very major one 
because of the impact, thanks to Craigie, and particularly in the evangelical circles, this was had. And even before Craigie, Meredith Klein, uh, who was actually the first evangelical in the 60s that brought this covenant renewal understanding you know, into this could be the pattern of Deuteronomy. But the answer is, is that uh, no, we don't have evidence of this like, like this kind of structure among the Egyptians. So it's a place where, uh, you know, if Moses is being influenced, and we would say the Holy Spirit's allowing him to be influenced more by the Mesopotamian Hittite uh, structure and, uh, and uh, statements than the Egyptian. Then the classical understanding of Victoria would be just the collection of speeches. Right. Speeches. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that was the position. That was the understanding until all this archaeological evidence was found. Yes. That's from New Testament times yeah. up until. Yeah. And that's that's a, and that's in the providence of God. I mean, I appreciate you know what, you know, uh, Craigie in particular has done with uh, this extra biblical you know information, and of course he's used it as an apologetic. And he follows at that point, as I said, Meredith Klein and also Kenneth Kitchen, an ancient uh, orient of the Old Testament, that uh, as, this, as, this, as these Hittite treaties, you know, became known, um, all of a sudden, you know, conservatives, you know, where the liberals had a chance to say, told you so. You know, told you that this had mosaic connections and you refused, you know, coming up with your, you know, your source theories and everything you're going to learn in OTI. And, and it was a way for us to get back. And, and, and I appreciate, I, I appreciate wanting to get back at liberals. Uh, I, I love it when they are, you know, when they are shown to be an error. Uh, but I think in our apologetic, we went too far. Because then you got to think in terms of, are we saying that, um, you know, 18 centuries of Christians could not truly understand Deuteronomy because they didn't have this ancient Near Eastern background. You know, and so have we swung too far the other way and not allow the text to stand as the text? All right, and, uh, and I, I think all that archeological discovery c should do is enhance, you know, what men led by the Holy Spirit have found in the past, not go continually counter to what they found in the past. But that's a theological, that's a theological decision I make, not an exegetical decision. But I think I'm on good theological grounds, as, as I think in terms of, of um, you know, uh, has God left the key for us understanding Scripture? You know, buried somewhere under the sands of the of the of uh, the Middle East. And my answer is no. It only enhances. It only gives us a greater appreciation and understanding what men directed by the Holy Spirit have seen in the past. Because, because what happens, and, and I wouldn't be so crass to say this about Craigie's position, but there's almost a, you know, a sense in which, you know, biblical background, historical background, archeological discovery trumps what is in the scripture itself. The ultimate authority is not the background, the ultimate authority is the scripture. The background only enhances it. And again, now the shoe's on the other foot in the scholarly community. That evangelicals, conservatives had their heyday in the 60s to the 80s, and then in the 90s, and you'll hear about this in OTI, now we've had archeological discoveries which seem to, in their interpretation, counter what is in the Bible. And so now we have the arising of what is known as biblical mimilus. That is, that. Uh, you know, these extra, this extra biblical information counters what's in the Bible. It shows that it's historically inaccurate. So what archeology span gives, archeology span can very quickly, you know, take away. So we've got to be careful. You know, archeology, span extra biblical data, only enhances our understanding of what is in the scripture. It doesn't change, it doesn't, it doesn't determine our understanding of what is in scripture. So it, 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 you gotta remember, I went to seminary during the, the glory days. When, was, when in Old Testament studies, conservatives were getting the upper hand. See, we told you so. 
And in, interestingly, um, and this was back in the, uh, the 60s and 70s, that evangelicals were much more um, embraced you know, in the Old Testament academy than they were in the New Testament academy. I remember Dr. Walbert saying, I can, I, I can find an evangelical with a PhD in Old Testament, I can find 10 of them who take at that point the Dallas Seminary Statement of Faith, so the Massive Seminary Statement of Faith, close. I can find 10 Old Testament scholars for every one with a PhD who still holds to our doctrinal position in New Testament studies. Now, he can't say that today. In other words, Old Testament, Old Testament men are going to be uh, under the withering uh, 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 nature of skepticism in Old Testament studies today, just as there are in New Testament. But for about 30 years there, so it was like, it was like the, and, and Craigie's commentary is almost the high point that comes out of that era. See, we told you so. We were right all along. And let's face it, um, even evangelicals can be carnal. And, and I do, I mean, I, I, I like to win a victory over the liberals as well. I'm, I'm carnal too, um, but, uh, uh, but, but God has certainly uh, given us a more humble position uh, today.